Okay, good morning, everyone. Um, welcome. to this uh, Parthenos webinar, um, how to work successfully with e-humanities and e-heritage infrastructures. The devil is in the details um, with Marie Perrin and Klaus Illmeier, um, who will contribute this webinar, especially for the Love Data Week. And we are very happy to be part of it with Parthenos. Um, while people are still arriving, um, I will explain in a few words um, how this uh, webinar functions. Uh, you already received some instructions in uh, a previous email with your registration, but just uh, as a little reminder, um, during the webinar you will be muted automatically and you can also not be seen, only the chat. Um, you are very welcome to ask questions and also um, to give remarks on the presentation, but you can only do that via the chat um, that is at the right hand side uh, below at your screens. And um, if you want to make it very easy for us, it would be great if you use the word question in advance when you have a question. Um, we have at the end of the presentations, um, we have time to answer the questions, um, so we will collect them during the webinar. Um, if you have any sound problems, please test your technical uh, settings. I hope you all can hear me, um, but those who can't hear me, they hopefully read that they have to click the speaker symbol uh, to be able to hear me. Um, yeah, that's all for uh, the housekeeping. Um, just uh, already as a little announcement, we have prepared a feedback survey um, at the end uh, of the webinar. So we are very keen to hear from you um, with improvements. But let's start with the webinar. Um, this webinar has been organized um, by the project Parthenos, um, of which uh, I am a member. And Parthenos uh, stands for Pooling Activities, Resources and Tools for Heritage, E-Research, Networking, Optimization and Synergies. Parthenos is a Horizon 2020 project, and its main aim is to strengthen the cohesion of heritage-related e-research for all kinds of activities and you are today part of a training activity. Um, Partenos runs until 2019 and it is a very um, international uh, project. So we have around uh, 16 partners from nine European countries and uh, some are also present today. Um, Partenos is coordinated by PIN in Italy. Yeah, that's uh, all about Paternos, but much more to, important today is um, to present to you the two trainers of this webinar, which I'm very delighted that they um, agreed to be trainers today. And um, they're both members of the Paternos project and, and experts um, in uh, these uh, fields that are covered today. And uh, let me just say a few words um, so you can see them already now, Klaus uh, Ilmeier and Marie Purin. And I want to start with uh, introducing uh, Marie. Uh, she is a junior researcher in digital humanities at the French National Institute for Computer Science and Applied Mathematics, short INRIA, at Paris. And um, as I said before, she is a member of the Paternos uh, project where she has her um, focus on the works on the development of standards uh, for research tools in arts and humanities, and also especially um, in uh, data management. Um, besides, Marie also contributes to another Horizon 2020 project called Imperion, and that is uh, dedicated to the restoration and conservation of cultural heritage. 
Um, the second trainer for today is uh, Klaus Illmeier, and uh, he um, is a, has his focus on theater, film, and media studies, and uh, received also a PhD um, with a focus on uh, digital humanities for theater studies. Um, and he also is working on a digital platform for theater studies. Um, besides this, um, he is also involved in Patenos um for the austrian center for digital humanities um at the austrian academy of sciences and here he focuses hi on everyone the and thank you quality. thank you richly for your quality of metadata so it's a good pleasure for so me and for marie that's to hold um this from me yeah, about so our trainers so and, and the floor is all to klaus uh, and marie. insights into good our work and we're talking about about uh, how to connect with even infrastructures, with digital infrastructures as we build up in Patenos. So as you can see here in the slide, um, I'm sitting, because it's a kind of experiment also for us to do this webinar, I'm sitting here in Vienna, uh, Marie is sitting in Paris, and Ulrike in Potsdam, so that's also a kind of experiment to see how this works out. And we would like to, uh, as a warm up, to find out from where are you participating. So if you may, if you can use this chat function on the bottom right, please uh, enter where are you sitting now, and maybe you can also add your institution if you like. And it's also already a, um, a kind of reminder that. You can in between ask questions in this chat and Ulrike will collect them and after our presentation there is a question answer section where we'll answer these questions. So I see already some haters are coming there. So oh that's great. We have very different places people joining us. So that's great. Oh yeah. Super. <laughs> All over Europe is the, uh, there are some people outside of Europe. Yeah, so South Africa, that's great. Hi to South Africa. Okay, great. So um, you can still type into it. And I hope everyone now is used to this chat function. And we are waiting then your questions after our presentation. So what we are talking uh, about uh, in, in the next minutes is um, I will start and give you a brief uh, introduction to what are in infrastructures. Um, we will then talk about uh, how you can uh, engage with these e infrastructures by preparing data because that's a crucial aspect. Um, and we will kindly introduce to you the fair data principles and we will talk about how to apply standards. And Marie will uh, talk about especially about the standards uh, aspect, and she will introduce to you the standardization survival kit, the SSK, which is developed in the framework of Patinos. We will then have some conclusions, and we also have some conclusions in between, and then we will start the question and answer section. So, begin with, yeah. So that's already our title. So we are talking about e-humanities and e-heritage research infrastructures. And um, to give you a brief introduction, a brief definition, you can have a look at Patenos. Uh, we already talked about Patenos. So uh, if you look there in the um, observation of Patenos, so it's about activities, it's about resources and tools. That's already important parts of an infrastructure. And as it is a research infrastructure, there is clearly a focus on research communities. And these research communities here are mainly from the humanities, so we're talking about the humanities here, and from the heritage of the infrastructure sector. And what uh, infrastructure should ideally do is to connect uh, people, communities from, uh, from the humanities and from the heritage field. What is also important, because it's all about digital here, uh, an infrastructure should enable you to connect analog, your analog research 
and doing this in a digital platform, in a digital environment. So you can make analog and digital research. It also can connect digital infrastructures. So we have maybe different infrastructures and they come together and looking for interfaces, how to get data from one infrastructure to another infrastructure. In doing so, uh, one of the key, key factors for infrastructures is that we need standards. We need to harmonize standards and we want to share best practices. Uh, I'll give you some examples. You have a link there. You can also always look, uh, click, click on the links, then uh, in your browser, uh, Windows will open. So that's from containers. We're doing a joint resource registry there, uh, where resources come together, where resources from different data holders are collected. And we already mentioned the this page. And there is also a collection of recommendations and best practices. So to say, Patenos itself is an e-infrastructure. That would be the first example here. So now going a little bit deeper into this, this uh, e-infrastructure, uh, what is a key success for infrastructures is that it um, helps communities and it, it co connects communities. So it is a community-driven digital environment for research. And what we are share in an e-infrastructure would be, on the one hand, we want to communicate, but we also want to share resources, that's mainly data, and we want to share tools and services and experiences about tools and services. And if you want to push the, the infrastructure to a, to a bigger uh, aspect, then you would also say that you want to integrate virtual research environments. So a virtual research environment bundles all of these things I talked about. So it combines the tools, it helps you in putting data into tools and services, and it establishes therefore a digital workflow where you then can work in your community on your research project. And so if, if you push the limit a little bit more, then you would also say uh, infrastructure should combine different communities. But that is already something that gets a little bit tricky because communities are very tailored needs yeah and if you take the big infrastructure aspect then things get tricky but what a infrastructure ideally should do is it should give you a technical framework and this technical framework should support you in the this so-called research data life cycle so you may ask what is a research data life cycle so i have one example here there are different uh, models. What is a research data life cycle? This is the one from the UK Data Archive, and that's a very clean uh, research data life cycle. So you would start, uh, let's start with pointer. So you would start with creating your data. You process your data afterwards. You will analyze your data. You preserve your data. You give access to data. And then people, either you or others, will reuse data. And in this, a new research data life cycle would start with this new created data. So your data iterates over this cycle. Uh, but what's behind this? So please keep remember this, this cycle. So I have the next slide. Uh, but it's important that every step in this life cycle does rely on different tools and services. And it also relies on different practices. Therefore, it's really important to share best practices and to have a good understanding which tool helps you in which step. So I have one example. So if you want to preserve data in a long-term perspective, you usually uh, take the approach that you go to a digital archive. So we at our institution at APDH have Arche and this helps you in preserving this uh, data long-term. So that's already a specialized approach. Um, important here is the combination, we have different tools, and an e-infrastructure should ideally help you, therefore. So what the scope of e-infrastructures is, they enable sharing, you know, in a basic level, yeah. And that can scale up, as I already explained, maybe you start with a simple communication tool to, to connect uh, researchers together, but maybe you end, and or you would like to end in a 
digital platform that gives you good experiences, that uh, delivers services, it supports the work with data, and it gives you access to tools. So therefore, it comes that there are different sizes of e infrastructures. And one important remark here is that not always the biggest e infrastructures help you in your uh, uh, in your work and in a research project, so maybe you start with a smaller infrastructure that is near, more tailored on your specific research purposes. And to give you an example, a really small infrastructure that would be your local computer where you work with and where you do your research work and where you install different tools. So that would be really maybe the smallest infrastructure here. Uh, I give you some more examples, so um, maybe you can click on this if it's interested, and we will share afterwards also the slides, so you can then afterwards look at uh, these examples. So that's really, there are a lot of infrastructures around here, and this is now a more Europe-centered uh, perspective. Um, so you would start with, with a research project, or if you start with a research project, you probably have your own e infrastructure that you created. You will then scale up uh, to institutions, so they support you, so my institution, the ACTH, uh, or Marie's, Miria, help you in, in give you advice uh, how you can do your research work and so on. And this scales then up to national consortia, so we are different institutions uh, come together and uh, share their experiences. And research is all about international. So we surely have transnational networks. Uh, we have two examples here, uh, different examples here. And very important for us here in Europe are Clarin and Daria. Clarin is very centered on language related studies and Daria is uh, tailored to the needs of humanities, especially history and different kinds of humanities. And they're all, they both are parts also for Copatinos. Um, what is also important, what are also infrastructures are, so I call it data hubs. So a well-known example is Europeana, where from the GLAM institutions, the gallery, libraries, archives, and museums institutions, the material is collected there and you can use uh, single entry point where you can search for this material. Uh, we also have some tools like GitHub that's widely used by researchers. Um, and GitHub is a commercial uh, company, but it also delivers you a nice e infrastructure where researchers and companies meet. So what is the background of an e infrastructure? Important is a combination of hardware and software. And um, and in this consequence, it also is a maintenance of system. The combination. So if you have a research project that's really, uh, so you start with a research project and it's limited time uh, you work on this, it's important to have the maintenance uh, after the project. Uh, um, E-infrastructure also will then develop and integrate new services, will look for the needs, uh, the new needs for our researchers and will go in, into this. And what's also a tricky thing uh, sometimes is uh, uh, to create a user interface that supports this participation um, in helping you to do things really easy. And as you see, it can really get complex. The more participants, the more services and so on, this gets really complex. So, um, the first uh, uh, so this is a summary, so how should an infrastructure look like from the perspective of a user? We should not be bothered with the technical back background. This should all happen silent, but it's still important that it's clearly documented, that we understand the technical configuration, that it be transparent, so and therefore preventing a kind of black box. And what's also important is it, will, it should provide you an easy entry point. 
Um, for you as a user, what are the requirements for working with the infrastructure? Clear. You start with a research question. You need a research question, or even better, you have a research data. And ideally, and that's often the case, you have a running project or a project in preparation. And with this, you can really connect with the media infrastructure and then work further on with your data, connect with others. So it supports you in, in, in this. And in engaging with it, uh, you work further on that a lot of people know your project and so on. Uh, what's also important a requirement is that you understand what you need by an EV infrastructure because there are a lot of them and it's also important to understand what your requirements are. That comes to the second uh, summary how an EV infrastructure should look like. Ideally, or, or that's, that's the goal of, of, of EV infrastructures is to have a rich combination of this data, of, of the services and tools and it should support you, therefore, in your research question. And it should also support your implementation of the research data lifecycle, as I already told you. Uh, and what's really key is that it facilitates research. And it also harvests research data. So it should also give uh, interfaces for cultural heritage institutions uh, to put your data inside so that researchers can work further on. And here it's important to, to, to give you the hint that there is no one approach fits it all in infrastructure, there are different ones. And you have to look what is the best suited for me. Uh, yeah, how to connect with an e infrastructure? So that's maybe an important question, and I put it, uh, I highlighted this activity uh, words. So ask colleagues what they are using if you don't know about the infrastructure, discuss it in your community. What are people using? What are the needs by your research community? Connect with your local support institutions, like I told you, the ACDH, where I work on such a support institution. Conduct directly an e-infrastructure. That would be the clever way to, to get in connection with an e-infrastructure. And as I already told, uh, compare these different e-infrastructures. So you should know a little bit about your teacher get a feeling which inter the infrastructure fits the best for you. Uh, I give you some further information so that you can look at them afterwards. Um, I want to highlight this spontaneous training suit where there is a really good uh, a wider introduction to research infrastructures so that goes more into details and explains other approaches. So what I want to give you a takeaway messages on the chapter of e-infrastructures is e-infrastructures connect different stakeholders. For researchers, that means e-infrastructures want to support you. They want to, uh, so they should give you access to data for research. And it allows you to create impact for research. That's also important. And on the perspective of cultural heritage institutions, it's a connection with the researchers. So it also raises, raises the dissemination of your data and it enables researchers to work with these data. And that can, may uh, evolve to giving you the, to deliver new insights into this data, which then can give you a better, better experience of your data. Important here to highlight is to succeed in this, we require good data quality. And that's a community effort. So every one of you who are joining us here in this webinar, uh, we need to work on data quality to help this e-infrastructure approaches. And e data quality is important because, um, okay, uh, uh, data quality is important, there's a key message here. So what we want to talk uh, about, then, uh, then Marie takes a little bit take, uh, later over. So we want to show you the spare data principles and how you can apply it. And we want to, to, to um, we, we would like that you keep in mind that you should use standards for your data. And the important uh, the key to success here is good preparation and continuous work on data quality. So we have a little poll prepared. So um, if you can put this poll there, I'll 
Can you please vote for this poll so we are not sure if you are aware of these fair data principles and we are interested if you already know the fair data principles so that we can get a little insight. Okay, I already see the first votes coming in, in, into. Okay, I see here uh, people are knowing the, the fair data principles. Yeah. I, I, so some people are don't have the first time of this pair data principles. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah, okay. Yes, okay, I see a lot of people know the pair data principles, but they do not know how to apply them on their data. So to keep it short, um, e-infrastructures, and Patinas is also working on this, uh, will help you give you advice how to apply this pair data principle. The fair data principle, that's an acronym, it stands for findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. reusable. And it, it points to data, so data should be fair. That's key success here. Yeah? And, and this is also something that uh, has a lot in common with data quality. So the fair data principles are compiled by Force 11. You can see the links and get more information on this. And it's, there are more generic principles. So there are different ways to, to, to integrate them uh, in your needs and into in infrastructures. And they help you in the research data life cycle. And they also will help us in the further development of e infrastructures. And they are kind of guidelines. Uh, I have here a, a graphic uh, image from, from the Force 11 website where you can see. Our goal is that data and metadata and so on will become green. So you start with totally unfair data, which no one can use, and we want to have really good fair data that can be used by other people, by researchers, and also can be processed by machines. So that would be our goal here in applying these fair data principles. Uh, I give you some further information on the fair data principles, and time rushes on. So. Uh, the important message here for me is make your data fair. And I guess uh, 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 Marie will now take over. And, uh, this is actually um, not, not Marie at the moment. Um, we had uh, lost her to a very um, to a technical problem, but uh, she has managed to re enter the webinar. And, um, and um, I hope she's okay. So, do you, do you hear me? Yeah, oh, sorry, I'm so sorry. I had a problem with my connection and this is the first time it happened, so I'm so, so sorry. <laughs> so the presentation is currently uploading. So the, the slides are uploading. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I cannot I cannot see them, but in a few minutes it will it will work. Um, sorry sorry for me interrupting again, uh, Marie. Yeah. Marie. Yes. The, the slides are visible already. No, for not for me. But you can hear me. We can ah, okay. hear you and we can this also is, see is, the uh, slides. The slides are here. So, so I'm so sorry. So, uh, thank you, Klaus. I had a rough time with my connection. But, uh, so, <laughs> first, a good question. Uh, how can you make your data fair? Uh, I will just try. So, how can you make your data fair? So, with a data management plan, that will help you to apply the FAIR principles to your own research data.
For instance, the H2020 guidelines on data management states that this document helps Horizon 2020 beneficiaries make their research data findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable, so fair. <coughs> this is the sorry. This is the during the uh, during the phase plan uh, research project of the research life cycle. You can see another way to, to represent the research life cycle here. So this is during the phase plan research project of the research life cycle that you will produce the data management plan or DMP. But by the way, what is a data management plan? First of all, it seems necessary to have a clear definition of research data. We can adapt the definition given by Margaret Henderson. Research data is data that is collected, observed, or created for purposes of analysis to produce original research results. This definition is actually wide enough to cover a wide variety of disciplines and also uh, research outcomes. So this data can be observational, uh, experimental, uh, generated uh, from test models like simulation, derived or compiled like text or data mining, uh, response or canonical, for instance, gene sequence data banks. And therefore, uh, research data can adopt multiple forms like text or word documents, spreadsheets, laboratory notebooks, questionnaires, videotapes, photographs, slides, samples, databases, methodologies, output for analysis software, and even standards. Uh, producing research data is one thing. Then, they require an active management. It means an ongoing management, like with backup, uh, migration, and conversion, all along the data lifecycle. Uh, it means also an action plan in terms of data quality, technical feasibility, financial viability. It also means uh, that you will optimize resources for a specific purpose because you will identify and make visible the action to be, conduct, to be conducted, sorry. plan key stages, deadlines, and also critical time periods. In other words, don't let your data manage you and keep yourself organized. Actually, a data management plan is a document that outlines what you will do with your data both during and after your research. This plan describes the data you expect to acquire or generate during the course of a research project, how you will manage, describe, analyze and store this data, and what mechanisms you will use at the end of your project to share and preserve your data. Data management plans are meant to ensure that your data will be preserved and useful both now and in the future by both you and other researchers. But in practice, how a data management plan can help you to make your research data fair. So there are four parts in a DMB. First, in the data description part, you describe which data will be collected or generated by the project. Then, in the standards and metadata part, you explain which metadata or standards will be used. And in the data sharing part, you will explain how this data will be exploited, shared, made accessible. And finally, in the data storage and preservation part, you describe how this data will be administrated and preserved. Each part of the DMP that you complete helps you to make your data fair by making your own decisions about your data visible, stable, coherent, and understandable by others and by you in the future. But I think you'll need more than a definition of a DMP to know how to proceed with your own data. 
In practice, your data are findable because you pick a naming convention and stick to it. You provide clear version numbers. You create metadata describing your data. You include appropriate standards for the content and format of your data. As structure information, it's essential to make your data fair. Metadata are often called data about data or information about information because they describe, explain, locate a resource. They make it easier to retrieve, use, or manage an information resource. With them, you are able to describe digital resources by specifying their properties, such as intellectual content, production context, files and data characteristics, and intellectual property and usage rights. With ADMP, your data are accessible because you deposit your data and associated metadata in a research data repository, and you precise which methods and software tools are needed to access your data. Your data are also interoperable because you use standards to modelize and describe your data, and you use standards, vocabulary, vocabularies, or ontologies for your metadata. And your data are reusable because you have obtained the informed consent for people participating to the research when it's necessary. You license your data with a license as open as possible, and you store your data in a long-term archive. So in other words, the devil is in the details when it comes to fair data. You may have understood from this presentation that you have to pay attention to very, very important details. Standards. Standards are crucial for making your data fair, and more generally, for research. When he was appointed as chairman of the ISO Committee TC47, Laurent Romary said that standards are a key to great digital research which helps to discover and understand our cultural and societal life. But you may wonder why standards seem so important. First, we have to understand what they are. Standards inform you about practices, protocols, artifact characteristics, or data formats. They can be used as reference when you work with colleagues from your field so that you can produce comparable or interoperable results. They are not regulation. You don't have to follow them, but you should. They are published and maintained by standards organizations, and maybe you know the Text Encoding Initiative Consortium, the International Organization of Standardization, of the World Wide Web Consortium. To be called standards, they must fulfill three requirements. They express a consensus, a wide and possibly international community of experts as they love them. They are published and easily accessible. Anyone who wants to know their content is able to access it. They are maintained, they are replaced, replaced or duplicated, sorry, depending on the technical and scientific evolution of a field. And standards enable researchers to work together, but also to work on the same data sets, even if they don't share the same scientific goals. So let's take the example of the work done by Naomi Truan for her PhD on representations of the over in the British, French, and German discourse on Europe, a corpus-based contrastive discourses analysis. So she created a corpus of parliamentary debates on Europe at the Deutsche Bundestag, the House of Commons, and the Assemblée Nationale between 1998 and 2015. Naomi Truan is a linguist, but as she annotated the corpus in TEI with a stable and precise list of metadata, it is possible for another researcher to easily understand and reuse this data for another research project, for instance, on European history. 
It is possible to do so because Naomi Twan used the standard VTEI or Tech Tangling Initiative to modelize her data. And it means she respected a specific schema to create metadata and she produced files in an open and non proprietary format, namely XML. In other words, these data are interoperable. As you can see, standards exist for metadata. In this case, it is referred as to metadata schema. A metadata schema consists of a definite set of characteristics to describe data. For instance, one of the most commonly used metadata standards is Dublin Core. Actually, standards are very important for metadata because they guarantee the reliability of the metadata and therefore the reliability of the data themselves. Besides, they enable other researchers to easily reuse the data that are described. As explained on the Parthenos training website, standards are used to ensure that metadata is as useful as possible. And by extension, they ensure that data are useful because interoperable. So the experience gained within the research infrastructures represented in Parthenos is that there is always an initial phase during which, during which researchers should be made aware of some core standards. Therefore, elementary research projects should be encouraged to refrain from defining their own local formats and to first demonstrate that their needs are not covered by the wide variety of already existing initiatives in the digital humanities landscape. This is basically, basically what has led Parthenos to identify the notion of the Standardization Survival Kit, or SSK, a toolkit available online. So just for, in for your information, the website will be launched in a few days. <laughs> So because there is no obligation to use a given standard, it is essential to provide potential users with an awareness of the appropriate standards and the advantages to be gained by adopting them. So the work carried out by the SSK covers four types of activities related to the use of standards in the humanities and cultural heritage fields. Documenting, documenting existing standards, supporting the adoption of standards by identifying how they relate to research scenarios, communicating with research communities, and training for researchers. To apply this for principles, the SSK focuses on giving researchers access to standards in a meaningful way. That is why it is built around research scenarios. So this is, these scenarios are the core of the SSK because they aim at providing contextual information and relevant examples on how standards can be applied in a given research project. They intend to cover most humanities disciplines, from literature to heritage science, including history, social sciences, linguistics, etc. And this scenario has been created and aided to by domain experts from real-life researcher-oriented use cases. Those scenarios can be seen as a living memory of what you should be the best research practices in a given community. For that reason, the SSK can be considered as a framework showing concrete use of standards rather than simply a catalog of research. Each scenario within this SSK works like a high-level research guide for scholars. They are made up of successive scenarios involved specific tasks and can be followed by a complete, a complete process to solve a given problem with the most standardized means. For each step, the appropriate uh, resources to perform the given task are proposed, divided in two categories. The general resources, that includes your primary documentation and tools, and the project-specific resources that point to concrete use cases in which a same similar task was accomplished. The material contained in this section is of various kinds, 
training materials, like tutorials, a state-of-the-art bibliography, which includes all the documentation needed to carry out a given task, and technical resources such as style sheets, code samples, software or services. So as you may have understood, an e-infrastructure such, such, such as Parthenos helps you to pay attention to details, like standards. They help you to create research data that are fair. So e-infrastructure enables you to improve your results and make better science. And to conclude, a short takeaway message. For better data, don't mess with the devil, which means don't mess with standards. So this is okay for me. <laughs> I'm done. Yeah, thank you very much, Marie and Klaus, um, for this very interesting um, presentation and uh, also um, for uh, room for thoughts, probably for many questions. And uh, I think we can directly go into the um, question and uh, answer section, the discussion. So I'm just waiting for the participants to um, type uh, their questions. And uh, there was already from several people the question um, if we will be sharing the slides. Um, yes, uh, we will uh, share this, uh, the slides. Um, it will um, take a moment to put them online, but we will um, share them via the training suite and we will also deposit in a, in a repository, um, probably in, in, in uh, the repository HAL. Um, there is uh, a new question um, uh, from uh, Miriam um, and I think it's a question for Marie. Um, she is asking when the uh, sanitization survival kit will become um, available. Marie? Marie, you are muted if you are talking. <laughs> Maybe. Ah, there she is. Marie? So the standard survival kit will be available, we hope, this week. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah, Ulrike? Yes. Because I have our, yes. Uh, yeah, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. No, no, I'm not muted. We hear you. You 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 see me? Can you hear me? Yes, Marie, we hear you. We are really sorry, but there seems to be a problem with the internet connection at the okay, building. So, uh, I have um, connection problem again. So it's, <laughs> it's a nightmare. So the, the SSK will be available, we hope, next week. Or, yeah. For, for first of all, so, yeah, sorry. <laughs> Okay, um, so we are really looking forward to um, the launch. It will be um, widely, oh, it will be widely um, announced also via um, the Partners uh, outreach uh, channels. 
and um, so then you can all uh, try it out um, and uh, give us uh, feedback also on it. Um, and uh, okay, let's uh, move to the next uh, question from Paul. Um, and uh, I think it's a question for Klaus. Um, can you hear me? Thank <laughs> God. I'm so sorry. He is asking. Um, Marie, we can hear you. <laughs> sorry. Um, let's come to the question um, to Klaus from Paul. Um, he asked, uh, Klaus mentioned that fair data will not necessarily be open. And he um, asked to explain mm -hmm. what the Thanks difference the will be. Yeah. I'm not sure if I directly mentioned it. Um, so the recommendation is to make your data as open as possible. <laughs> and data in general should be fair. But uh, if it's open, depends also on your research data. So there are good uh, um, arguments that some research data that's sensible and so on will not be open. So keep in mind if you have social studies, interviews and so on, where you want to have the people anonym, anonymized and the answers. So there are some situations where you would not put your data open. So FAIR is a good balanced thing. So it, say, it tells you be as open as possible. And you should keep in mind, but on the, say, on, on the same, it also uh, gives you the possibility to be FAIR, but not to be open. So because in some situations, this is a crucial thing here. So I hope I explained a little bit the difference. Welcome. Putting some information also on the chat. He he's an expert on fair and versus open. So thanks for all. Okay. Um, I see. Also, there is a discussion now going on um, in the chat. Um, so maybe we take uh, sample, uh, something from there uh, as well. Um, and thank you very much for your elaboration on the um, question from Paul. Um, we had another question from um, Dubrovka and uh, he or she is asking if there is a comparison with the US systems in use. Um, I was just asking for a little elaboration on the question because, at least for me, I'll get it. Um, okay, so the thank you for elaborating. Um, so it's the it's actually about the differences between the European recommendation regulations and. Um, the copyright rules, for example, in the United States. So um, I, I guess that's uh, more a question probably for Klaus. Yeah, yeah, I also would like to know if that would, would be my, my first answer. Um, there are sure differences, especially when it comes to, to copyright, but also when it comes to data protection. So in my, there will be in the European Union a new uh, um, rule on protecting data and that's sure something that is a difference uh, currently to the in the United States and, and abroad of Europe. So, but I do not know about a list or a website where all of these differences are compared next, next um, and I guess it's not so easy because, because things are changing really fast. Uh, if someone of the participants maybe know such a list, that would be great. But if I remember correctly, the, the, the Go Fair initiative, I put a link there, I can put it also in the chat, is looking on how to harmonize these different um, regulations and so, and to push these fair principles to a more global level. So because these regulations and laws, that's Every, every time something you have to keep in mind. 
especially when it comes to sensitive data, but also in other terms, data protection and so on. So I'll give you the link to this GoFair website. Okay, you're welcome. Yeah, I think um, we are very happy um, with uh, your um, answer and uh, all uh, hints at uh, more information are also very welcome. Um, but uh, first of all, thanks also for the link um, to the Go Fair um, initiative. We will collect um, this information from the uh, chat and uh, also share it then um, with the upload uh, of the slides uh, somehow. So we will notify you about this. Um, any more questions um, from the participants? I think we have time for one more question. And of course, um, you are also very welcome um, if you need a few more minutes to um, come up with your questions, um, uh, to send them to us uh, later. Um, I will show you um, the contact uh, email. Um, you can always send them via B and uh, we, can, uh, we will at least try to uh, address them in a little recap. We will be writing um, about this uh, webinar session uh, together with uh, Klaus and yeah, sure. Marie. You can come so. contact us every time you like. So we are happy to answer your questions and so yeah. Okay. Um, they're also drawing a close towards uh, the end um, of the, this webinar and uh, um, I have a few things to say um, besides first of all thanking again Klaus and Marie um, for uh, joining us and uh, sharing uh, their um, experiences and knowledge uh, about the FAIR data with us um, giving us uh, insight into the SSK um, and we are very much looking forward to um, the, the launch uh, in a few days, uh, maybe next week already. And thank you all for joining us um, as a participants and asking those insightful questions. If you would be willing to help us improve the webinar series, we would be terribly happy if you fill in the feedback um, survey. We will put a link to the feedback uh, survey in the chat and uh, I will also um, send it to you um, in a follow-up uh, email. So please leave also any comments um, there that help us uh, improve uh, for the next uh, editions. And um, last but not least, um, I have an announcement in um, case of partners training and the partners training suite. So you have heard already a bit about uh, new modules um, that will be coming up. Um, so I really invite you to have a look at the partners uh, website and have a look at the partners uh, main um, partners training website um, we put it uh, put uh, the links in the chat for you and um, if you like what you see um, please vote uh, for partners training in the digital humanities awards 2017 so that um, would be great and um, we are happy to receive your feedback. Yeah, um, so we are almost at the end. Um, it rests to me to say goodbye to you and uh, hope to see you in um, one of the next editions uh, of the Partners webinar series. Um, the next one is at uh, 22nd um, of March with uh, 
um, Stefan Schmunk and uh, Stephen Crower, um, and they will be talking about research infrastructures um, in a more general sense, and we will put in the announcement also in the chat for you. But the last Thanks words are to our trainers. Great Thanks for me. Bye bye. Um, I guess these technical issues are part of webinars, so it's also kind of interesting in troubles that always comes up. So thanks to all participants and thanks also to Marie and Alicia.